Good afternoon. Hey, hi everyone. Okay, so thank you very much for coming to my talk. I know it's the last one of the day. It's the last one in the conference. It's in English. Um, it's sunny outside, and I'm kind of wondering why you're here. But thank you for coming anyway. Um, hopefully, it's kind of pressure on me now to make it worth your while because you're missing out on that beautiful sun. I was I was a little bit worried before uh, coming up here because I haven't had any tea since this morning at breakfast. And as you may know, English people do not operate well without tea. So it was with great relief that I saw some tea bags downstairs. So I'm feeling good now. You see, tea built the British Empire. It's good for you. So uh, what am I going to be talking about? It's groovy for Java developers, but what does that mean? Um, to start off with, what it's not is a deep dive into Groovy itself. So we're not going to go into a lot of technicalities. If you've done a lot of Groovy yourself, if you're using Groovy day to day, it's not really the talk for you either, unless you want to use the examples as material for evangelizing Groovy to your coworkers, which I do actively encourage. Get everyone using Groovy. That's why I'm here. So. The other thing is it's not a tutorial. So you won't be learning from basics how to code Groovy. So what the hell am I here for? What am I going to talk about? It's very simple. I'm here to answer one question. And that question is, why on earth would you want to use a language called Groovy? I mean, how can anyone take it seriously when it brings up visions of Austin Powers. So uh, how many people are familiar with Austin Powers? Did it make it to the Ukraine? Excellent. For those that didn't put up their hands, uh, this is Mike Myers. And he did a spoof spy series of films. Uh, like the, the, uh, actually, his, uh, the film titles are a bit too rude, I think, to uh, repeat them here. Uh, but it's like Austin Powers is a 1960s-based spy who likes to say things like, groovy, baby, <laughs> um, and some other less uh, appropriate words. So it brings up these images. But I'm here to tell you that it is a serious language. So forget Austin Powers. I'm going to go through a series of scenarios, examples of where Groovy is a very good fit for most people and most projects. I'm not here to tell you that Java is rubbish and you should be using Groovy all the time. That is my personal opinion up to a point, but I'm not, I know that's a biased opinion. You know, we, we have to be aware of our own weaknesses and our own biases. Um, the truth is that uh, Groovy is a useful language in and of itself as an adjunct as a, a colleague, if you like, of Java. But before I go into those examples, let's get some background as to what Groovy is uh, from your side of things, as from the user side of things. So it's an object-oriented language for the JVM. It has a Java-like syntax. OK, it sounds like Java so far. So you know, what's the difference? Um, well, it's simple and expressive. You're going to see examples of what I mean by that. Um, but if you've taken the time to have a look at Java 8 and the Lambda functions, you'll, you'll already have some idea of uh, how concise and expressive code can be. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and more interestingly, it has optional types. And in fact, you have the choice to use dynamic typing or actually have compile time errors in your code. This is something that's relatively new to Groovy. It came with Groovy 2.0. So if you've looked at Groovy before, and it was with a pre-Groovy 2 version, then you may have some preconceptions which no longer apply. So this, again, is a, a good talk for you. So Groovy itself is a compiled language. I'm going to be talking about scripts. It's going to look like it's interpreted. It's not there is always a compilation step, because it always has to go into bytecode, which is then run on the JVM. So what this means is once you've compiled a Groovy class, 
you can run it using the standard Java command line. All you have to do is add the groovy jar file to the class path, plus all the jars for any libraries that you're using in your application or your script. Okay? But it is fundamentally compiled language. So how can you actually use it? Um, you're used to using Java in standard projects inside SRC main slash Java. Well, Groovy, you have a few more options. If you just want to try and dabble without going through actually installing Groovy, you can just go to groovyconsole.appspot.com and type Groovy in there and execute it. And that's the first example I'm going to use. Then if you actually decide you want to use it regularly, then you can get hold of the Groovy development kit. So analogous to the Java development kit. It's a zip file. You have to unpack it. You have to set up environment variables. And we all know how easy environment variables are to set up on Windows and how well behaved they are. Um, I've sworn more than a few times with that. Uh, but that's one approach. And that will give you the Groovy command line, kind of similar to Java. Uh, Groovy console and Groovy shell, sure, uh, which are two ways of um, working with Groovy in an interactive way. So Groovy console is like a swing-based local version of the web console. All the modern hipster folks, though, are using something called GVM. And GVM allows you to just specify GVM, install Groovy, and specify a version, and it will just uh, download it, unpack it, set up your environment variables for you, and you're good to go. And it allows you to actually use different versions of Groovy for different terminals or command prompts. Uh, has anyone used RVM, Ruby Virtual Machine? We've only got a, we've got a few hands. So you guys have some idea already of what GVM. It's analogous to RVM. And it can be used on Windows. Uh, in fact, it used to be the case you had to get Sigwin or msys. Uh, I, I just download msys git, because I always want to use git on a Windows machine. Uh, and I can use msys git to install GVM. And from there, I can install Groovy, Grails, Gradle, uh, Spring Boot, and a whole host of other tools. And it handles everything for me. But interestingly, not so long ago, only a few weeks ago, somebody created a variant GVM PowerShell. So if you don't want to install Sigwin or um, msys, you can try out GVM PowerShell, which is native to Windows. So that's very big news, very interesting. And of course, everybody likes to use IDEs, especially if you're working in a Java project. So it's good to know that your Eclipses, your IntelliJs, and your NetBeans all have plugins for Groovy, and all very, very good plugins for Groovy. Similar kind of experience as you would get with Java. And of course, the other sort of tooling are the build tools, Maven, Gradle, Ant as well. Um, I don't know if there are any others that people use, uh, but these all have Groovy options for compiling Groovy and Java together. OK, so those are the ways that you use it. But why would you use it? What would you use it for? So I'm going to switch to live coding at this point in time. We know how this all goes, right? I code, I talk, I mess up, and you shout out when I get it wrong and tell me what I got wrong, yeah? Oh, maybe not. OK. <laughs> I can see I'm on my own here. So this is the Groovy web console. Um, I just wanted to show a simple example. Uh, in this case, I just want to create a method called powers of two. And this will give me all the powers, two to the zero, two to the one, two to the two, so on, up to two to the n. OK? Now, the typical way of uh, doing this in, say, Java is with, um, let's do it up to eight. We create our list, which is going to contain, our, take our uh, powers of two. We're going to build up the list. And of course, we create a for loop, because it's iteration. So we go 
for all the numbers from 0 to n, uh, we add 2 to the power of i. OK? And of course, this is the bit I was forgetting in practice every time. You actually need to return the result. I do that all the time in Groovy and Java. OK? So what this gives us, if I execute the script, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 64. We all recognize these numbers. We're computer programmers. Computers speak in powers of two. You know, we've got our eight bits is 256. Yes? Anyway, um, that's OK. But this isn't really a groovy way of doing things. I want to demonstrate how things can be expressive. So I'm going to comment that out for now. I'm going to create another version, powers of two. And this time, it's the same signature, but I'm actually going to do it in one line. I'm going to say, I want the numbers 0 to the power of n. But I want to map each of those numbers to its equivalent power of 2. That is 2 star star it. I'm actually going to print 2 here, otherwise you're not going to trust me that I've actually executed this again. So there we go. It prints 2, and it prints the same number of numbers. Excellent. So if you've been looking into Java 8, you will already be familiar with this. Uh, in Java 8, the collect method is called something else. What's it called? Map. It's called map. Now, I'm kind of evangelizing Groovy, but I have to admit Java's got the method names right. Uh, collect is weird, to be honest. Um, and I think Groovy picked it up from Ruby, and I have no idea why Ruby came up with this name. But the idea is, uh, I've got a little diagram of it. If, uh, here we go, trades diagram, uh, powers of two. So this is what we want. We're given a list, 0 to n, and we want to map every element in that list to a new element in a new list where it's 2 to the power of n. OK? It's basically a, uh, a mathematical mapping function. So now you're going to say, well, hey, Java 8 can do this now, so why use Groovy? Um, well, for a start, this will work on Java 6, 7, and 8. If you want to use an older version of Java, you can use an older version of Groovy. So currently, we're at Groovy 2.3. If you want to run on Java 8, you have to use Groovy 2.3. Uh, but you can use, say, Groovy 2.1 and run on JDK 5, I think. OK, so that's just uh, an indication of the expressiveness. Uh, Groovy has this concept of uh, closures. So this highlighted block here is a closure. It's kind of like a Lambda function, but actually more powerful. And you're going to see some examples of where else it's used. So this example shows three things. One, Groovy is based on the Java class library. This is java.util.list. It's the standard Java int. Uh, if you use the object wrapper, it's java.lang.integer. Now, if you've done any other language, programming language, you will know that learning the syntax and semantics is only half the battle. The other half, or perhaps 95%, is learning a new class library. So the point here is that you don't have to learn a new one. Groovy is using the JDK. The other nice thing is it means that if you use Java 8, you can start using the new Streams API with Groovy. The uh, second point is that you can kind of optionally use types. So my method signature returns a list and takes an int. But in here, I'm just saying I have a variable called result. OK? So it's, it's optional. If you declare a type, it's actually enforced at runtime. You will get class cast exceptions if you try to return something other than a list, for example. And the third thing is that expressiveness that I was uh, talk talking about, having these mapping functions. So now this example is, what do I want done? rather than how should it be done. I don't care how it should be done. I just want the powers of two 
and this is the mathematical function, if you like, for that. Okay, so uh, one of the best ways of using Groovy is as a scripting language. In fact, many people view it as a scripting language, i.e. only good for scripts. So, okay, I want some hands here. I want to know what people use for scripting. Who uses Java for writing scripts? Simple, plain, old scripts. Yeah, that's pretty much... I was hoping that one person would put their hand up so I could ask them how. <laughs> um, but, yeah, Java's not a great option. Uh, how about Bash? I use Bash. Okay, quite a few people. Uh, Ruby? Yeah, uh, fewer people, fair enough. Python? Okay. So, uh, Bash seems pretty popular. Uh, it seems that there are quite a few people that don't use uh, any scripting at all, or use a language that's not terribly common. I apologize if I haven't listed all of the available options. But all of those have absolutely nothing to do with Java, and they have no syntax similar to Java. In fact, the number of hands that went up for Bash, I feel for you guys. That's, that's my go-to, typically, Bash. But every time I want to write a Bash script, I have to learn the flipping syntax of Bash and how its semantics work, and I spend like an hour trying to work out how said and awk work again. So for a job that was supposed to save me an hour, I've spent an hour trying to remember how to use the tools. That's not a good use of your time. So, why Groovy? Well, Groovy, you're used to the syntax, you're used to the class library, and it just works really effectively. So I've got an example. I want to create a text analyzer script. So if we have a... Ooh, that's worrying. Um, let us edit anyway. There you go. So if you look at the usage text here, it says text analyzer, it expects a text file, a path to a text file, and an optional string. So what I want to do is load the text file, count the number of characters, count the number of words, and optionally count how many instances of that string occur in the text file. So, <coughs> oops, where did they come from? So, uh, some may be getting a little nervous at this point. It's like, oh, how do you load a file? It's uh, like in Java, it's always been pretty horrible. But it's actually pretty nice here. So we create our file class, as you'd expect. Uh, our path to the file is in arg0. And then we just call the text property. I'll bet you didn't know that was on the file class. Well, it's not. Uh, Groovy adds it. So it's using the Java class library but it's extending it as well. So it's adding methods and properties that are really useful to people. And I tell you what, text property, if Java had that, it would make writing scripts in Java really easy if it wasn't for the fact that there's no easy way to do JavaScripts. Beanshell, perhaps. Beanshell would be uh, really good. So text property will just load the file and put it into a string. Yes, I know this isn't very efficient. If I try to load a gigabyte text file, this may have problems. The file's not that big. It's a demo. Get over it. So our char count is just the size of the text, the number of characters. Easy enough. What about the word count? Well, OK, so I worked out this uh, little technique. I don't know if it's accurate. It seems like it works, it sounds like it works to me, and I'm happy with it. If you're not happy with it, then come and beat me up after the talk, but only after the talk, okay. And then you can explain why it's wrong. But what I want to do is split the text on non-word characters, in fact, sequences of non-word characters. So if you know your regular expressions, this says, uh, any, I'll take word characters, until I get a sequence of non-work characters, throw those away, split, start again. And that should give me an array of all the words in the text. And then I can just say, OK, what's the size of that collection? Now, if I want the number of occurrences, I do have to check whether uh, that the, the argument was given. arg size equals 2. 
And then I do string count equals. OK, this one sounds tricky. How do you count the number of uh, occurrences of a string in another string? Uh, well, fortunately, Groovy adds uh, another method. So I can just do text count args one. See, OK, I have chosen an example that really suits Groovy, but still, I think this is cool. Right, and that's it. I've now done my analysis. Of course, I do want to add a report. So I go uh, println, uh, char count, pad right. So this is going to allow me to do some alignment plus char count. There we go. And word count. And finally, if string count, uh, we print ln. Plus string count. OK. Phew. Right. I've managed to type that in less than five minutes, which is pretty good going, I think, while trying to talk about it at the same time. So let's actually see whether this works. So if I uh, execute textanalyzer.groovy, it's going to complain I've got the num wrong number of arguments. So I have a pre prepared text file, uh, lazybones readme file. And there we go, char count just under 12,000 and just under 1,800 words. Uh, I can also specify how many occurrences of the word the, and it says there are 119. So this is demonstrating really that Groovy has, because it's got these extension methods, it is really powerful for doing file-based work, for de doing string manipulations, all these types of processing, uh, working with collections and maps, so much simpler. Uh, and even, God forbid that you actually want to um, do this, let's say you want to write an XML report. Oh, scary. OK, but it's not that scary and groovy. So let's try to do this quickly. Uh, we first want to open a new file to write to, report.xml. And then I use another Groovy extension method called withwriter. Now, the really cool thing about withwriter is it doesn't matter whether the code inside the block throws an exception or not. It will always close the file stream. It will never leave the file stream open. So it's very, very convenient for that. It's like resource-safe access, similar to the Java 7 resource, well, where stuff. OK, so uh, then we do use something called a markup builder and give it the writer. And this allows us to generate XML on the fly using Groovy code. So I want a root element called report. OK, and then I want the char count because I want my element to have hyphens because I want to make my life difficult. Uh, I need to actually put it in quotes because char hy hyphens are not allowed in Java methods. It's just verboten. You can't do it. So uh, we just do char count here and word count here. There we go. And finally, uh, if string count, I do a nested element search, which has uh, the string that I'm searching on, which is args1, and uh, occurrences. There we go, which is string count. And then, of course, we have to finish off all the braces. There we go. And again, and one final one. There we go. OK, so there's no XML there. You don't see any angle brackets and closed tags and anything. It's just groovy code. But all of these nested curly braces, these are all closures. So this is something you can't do with Java 8 Lambda expressions. And now, if I uh, run this again, I get the, oh, I get an error. Uh, somebody was supposed to notice this. Uh, line 41. Oh, 
Okay, that makes sense. An extra close marker. So I get the normal report, but now I have a report.xml with the generated XML. So you can see the element names matching the method names in the markup builder. So again, this is very uh, cool for Groovy, makes it very easy for scripting. It also makes it easy to parse XML, to parse JSON, and to generate JSON. OK, so um, this is so far used stuff that comes with Groovy. I mean, you can also use a, a Groovy SQL API for accessing a database. Uh, you can also use an Ant Builder class for using Ant tasks, which is, can be quite handy. For example, if you want to zip something up. Why is the JDK's zip uh, classes so hard to use? I mean, I just want to zip a bunch of files into a zip file. Why does it have to be so hard? So you can use the ant zip task instead, which is a lot, lot easier. So those are things that come with Groovy. But as we know, there are a lot of useful things that come with Java libraries. So the next example I want is script. But this time, uh, I want to use a library for accessing a REST service. Now, the JDK has URL and URL connection, but it doesn't really have anything for HTTP. So I want to use a little Groovy library that's really nice to use. It's called Groovy WS Lite, but it's not part of the Groovy distribution. So what I want to demonstrate here is that you can very easily use Java libraries from your Groovy scripts by using this at grab annotation. And it will download that dependency from Maven Central. So you can use anything in Maven Central. In fact, you can use any library in any Maven compatible repository. Okay. Sometimes you may have to specify the details of the repository. So um, I can now use this um, library. And I'm going to use it to access Google Maps API. Uh, now, uh, the Google Maps API, I'm just going to, it returns JSON at this particular URL. And I just want information about a location, and by default, San Francisco. Give me the details of San Francisco. Uh, I'm actually going to use something called JSON Builder to take the response content. So the response object has a JSON property which contains the JSON response body. I'm going to use that as the constructor to JSON builder just so I can pretty print it. Pretty string. There we go. So now I do a groovy rest example. Uh, and we get to see what the map API returns. It's a lot, a lot of junk. Now, I'm going to skip detailing how I want to access this information. Uh, bear with me. Uh, if you're interested, we can talk about it later. But for the moment, I'm just going to uh, copy some code I prepared earlier. And just remove that. So what I'm actually doing, uh, in fact, let's replace that with star dot. So if you're not familiar with Groovy, which I think many, many of you are not, this code may look a little bit strange and unusual, or maybe a bit scary. What I'm doing is accessing the JSON directly using properties, which match the names of the properties in the JSON itself. So the JSON has a root property called results. So that's what I'm extracting. I then uh, get that, that is a list, the value of that is a list, and I then get another list of the address components. Um, I won't go into more detail, but basically what it ends up doing is extracting the information I'm interested in, which is the city, the county it's in, the state it's in, and the country. And then I, we can see that uh, we can find out about London. I only know one London. There is only one London. But apparently, Google Maps thinks there are four, uh, two of them in the US, one in Canada. So you've seen the at grab annotation, which allows you to use external libraries for your scripts.
which means you can pass scripts around to anybody onto any machine without having to do any setup. They don't have to manually grab the jar files themselves and set everything up. Um, and it's also showing you how easy it is to parse and work with JSON. It really is very easy. Okay? You don't have to generate classes, a class hierarchy for it. Okay, so that's scripting. Uh, I've seen two uh, you know, useful examples, and that is kind of one of the easiest ways of starting to use Groovy in a Java shop, because you know, your managers don't care what you do for scripting. But it's effective, it's cross-platform, uh, and it's a syntax that you're familiar with, and a class library that you're familiar with. OK, so the next one I want to, example I want to look at is uh, Spock uh, or tests. So you've, you've been using the scripting. You really like the features that Groovy has. It allows you to express yourself easily. And you're kind of frustrated you can't use it in your projects. Well, again, Tests are one of those areas where people are less bothered about the language that, you're, that you use. Um, and it's where things like Groovy become powerful, uh, make life easier. You can use the list literals, the map literals, the easy loading of the file and extracting the full text of it. These are things that you might want to do in tests as well. So there was a talk, uh, was it yesterday on Spock? In Russia? Yes, OK. So I'm kind of out of order. I, th I feel I probably should have been before the Spock talk. So if you've been to the Spock talk, you won't learn anything here. But I just want to show that I have a normal project. I have a source folder. I have a test folder. I have a Java file here. Java file, uh, how I put it, Java, Java number helper.java, which just finds positives. Anyway, it doesn't do much special. But simply by adding the Spock library uh, in here, I have Spock core 0.7. I can use and run my tests using Spock. So this is one example that doesn't use Java number specification. But I uh, want to quickly show you uh, this one. OK, I'm going to do a bit of copy and pasting to help speed things along. And notice this is all operating inside an IDE. I'm using Spring Tool Suite, but you can use plain Eclipse. You just need the Groovy compiler. OK? So number helper finds positive numbers. Given a number helper instance, that's what we do. When. So Spock formalizes you in the given, when, then approach. Um, and also, the way it approaches tests it forces you to structure them and separate them out appropriately, rather than bung, you know, uh, include lots of individual separate tests into one test method that's impossible to understand. I'm guilty of doing that on more than one occasion. Uh, so I love the way that Spock forces me to take this approach. Uh, so let's say we've got a list of uh, numbers, 0, 1, 0, minus 1. And I expect the result, oh, I'm missing close square bracket. Uh, I want result equals expected. That should be, uh, should it be 1? Should it be 1 and 0? Good question. Um, I don't know at the moment. We'll find out. So let's save and run. So I can, from here, do uh, run as. Uh, no, it's not working. Hold on a second. There we go. Run as. Uh, ah, guess what I'm missing. I do all the preparation. I move uh, a folder. I'm missing JUnit, by the way. That's why it doesn't have run as JUnit. There we go. Uh, let's try that again. Run as. JUnit test. There we go. So a Spock specification can run as a, a JUnit test. So uh, we see here that uh, it failed. Uh, cannot cast objects with class array list to java.lang.integer. OK. So 
Let's go back to the editor. Uh, find positives. I think that should be fine. I don't like Java types. I've been doing Groovy so long. Um, but let's, let's give that a, another go. Yes, there we go. So this is actually another feature of Groovy. You can explicitly cast and, and convert objects by using the as operator. So I'm saying I've got a list, but Java's expecting an interay, so I'm going to use as interay to force a conversion. And Groovy will just handle it for me. OK, very useful. OK, so the really uh, nice feature of Spock that I do want to do is parameterization of tests. I believe that JUnit does do this now, but uh, Spock does it really well. So uh, we have our source and expected. So source and expected are two new variables. Where the hell are they coming from? Well, we specify them in what is known as a where block. Uh, and we specify this as a list. And now we can say, uh, we can specify sets of data. So it's still the same test, but we want to make sure it's a broad range of data that we're testing. Uh, does an empty list, I may, I'll probably fall foul of the uh, inter, inter array thing again. Uh, yeah, let's quickly change that back to that. And that back to that. OK, so an empty list should be an empty list. Uh, zero should be, again, an empty list. And uh, minus one, minus two should be an empty list. You get the idea. Uh, and then we have one, zero, minus one. And that should be just one. OK, and now I can run this. And it's actually run all of the data sets. Uh, if you're not certain that's actually happened, I can add an at unroll annotation. And that will expand them out. So let's run that again. And now we can see we've got four individual tests. OK, so Spark, well worth uh, checking out. Even if you want to use JUnit, you can write your tests in Groovy. That's absolutely fine you still get the benefits of uh, being able to do type coercion, having list literals, and so on and so forth. OK, so uh, let's go on to the next example. So let's assume that you've managed to get, test, you know, get groovy into the testing side of things. Um, what's another area without actually including groovy into your code base? because some people are still petrified of having like a dynamic language in your main source files. It's slow, or the compiler's not telling me what's going wrong. So uh, another approach is to use Groovy as an automation language for a Java system. To give you an example, I've used it in the past for a workflow system. So the workflow system. Um, executed tasks, but you could write tasks at Groovy, and they could be loaded at runtime. They didn't have to be pre-compiled and included on the class path. I've got a, a more um, contrived example here. So I have an application which has a trade DSL class, which is the API for my system. OK, it's a very simple API. I buy a share, I sell a share. The of is, you'll see why we have of shortly. But it's mainly about buying and selling, and that will produce stockholding instances. So a stockholding will be an epic, which is the three letters for the share. So um, Google is G O, oh, I can't remember what Google is. Um, VMware is VMW, for example, that's the epic, and the quantity. So what my app is actually going to do, though, is load at runtime a Groovy script and execute that against the trade DSL. OK? So let's have a look, quick look at the code. So again, this is all Java, app.java, stockholding.java, trades DSL Java. 
our app loads our Groovy script. It then creates something called a Groovy shell object. This is what allows us to execute a Groovy script at runtime. And then we evaluate, and we then extract. We actually run that script, in effect, against an instance of Trades DSL. OK? So let's actually run that. Uh, where am I? LS. So if I go into DSL, I can do Gradle W run. So that will package my Java application and execute it. And the application will then load the trades.groovy file. Ah, uh, oh, I have to specify CLI args equals trades.groovy. There we go. Let's try again. So there we go. The run is saying incorrect number of arguments. I must provide a path to a Groovy script. OK, and there we go. We have VM VMware, 1,300 shares. We've got 3,200 Apple and 2,250 Microsoft. So how did I do that? Is, were, were those numbers somewhere how encoded in the application? No. If we have a look at trades.groovy, we'll see where it's coming from. So I've got a trades equals, and then I have this series of by 100 of Microsoft, by 1,000 of Apple. OK, and if you sum up the buys and the sells, where the sells are negative, you get those resulting numbers. In fact, there's a slight hack that every time you buy or sell a share, it automatically gives you a starting 1,000, I think it is. OK, this is groovy code. It may not look like it, but it is. It's using Groovy's command uh, extensions. This is equivalent to this. OK, so we see that by is a method. 100 is an argument of that method. Of, again, is another method. And our MSFT, our, our epics, are turned into literal strings, which become arguments of of. OK, so Groovy actually allows you to uh, automate a, a Java system and give you kind of a DSL, a domain-specific language, in a very clean format. It's much easier to read the rest of these than it is the first one. The parentheses, the dots, the quotes are not really helping. They are requirements of the language in Java. So they, it, it's not useful information to the reader of the file. Okay. So this is another good use case for Groovy, running it at runtime, uh, loading it at runtime and executing it against a Java system. Okay, so um, I'm going to have to skip some of my examples, uh, but I do want to demonstrate Quicksort. So uh, some lucky people can get Groovy into their project as the main code base. So I wanted to quickly talk about, um, one, how does Groovy and Java relate to each other? The thing is, you can have Groovy and Java in a mixed project. It's absolutely fine. There is a joint, joint compiler which compiles the Groovy and the Java together. So your Groovy classes can depend on Java. Your Java classes can depend on Groovy classes. And it's just big, one happy circle of virtue, circle of virtue. OK, so what about this perception that Groovy is slow? There is a perception that Groovy is slow. So I have, uh, I basically took a, the Quicksort algorithm off the internet, borrowed somebody's Java implementation, uh, and didn't credit them. Slap on the wrist, I'm sorry. And I wanted to do a Java version, a Groovy version, and a Groovy version with uh, at compile static. So this is an annotation that came with Groovy 2. And you can probably work out what it does from the name. It will actually compile the um, class statically. So if we look at the Groovy version, if I try and call, oh, if I try, ah, it's not working very well. There we go. If I try and call a method that doesn't exist, OK? The IDE doesn't complain. 
because Groovy is by default a dynamic language, that method may exist at runtime. You and I know it doesn't, but the IDE can't say for sure. It doesn't know about it, though, so it actually underlines it. So you've still given the hint, even though it's not a compile time error. But we can use uh, type checked annotation if it is going to load up. No, I won't. OK. Uh, Eclipse is not liking me at the moment. So uh, I can show it in uh, compile static instead. So if I try test method now, it's got a red underline. It's got an error marker next to it. It's a compile time error because we added at compile static. OK. So I just want to uh, run this example now. So Gradle w run. And well, th what this is doing is taking a long uh, array of numbers and sorting them using the quick sort method. So if we have a look, um, this is something like 10,000 or 100,000 numbers. Uh, Java's taking 87 milliseconds. Groovy, the normal Groovy, is taking 157. And uh, at compile static is taking 21 milliseconds. My god, it's like five times faster than Java. Uh, yeah, of course we know to beware of uh, these types of benchmarks, um, particularly on small scales, on small numbers. Uh, they're all close enough that they're, they're kind of equally fast. It gets more interesting when we uh, load in CLI arcs and say one million. How many zeros is that? That's 10 million, I think. <laughs> Let's try that. Uh, so let's sort 10 million numbers. Uh, I print out the numbers of the sorted list to make sure that it looks sorted. It's actually doing something. And now we see uh, nearly 200 milliseconds for Java, nearly two seconds for normal Groovy, but it's back down to 200 milliseconds for Groovy at compile static. So if you're worried about speed, then you can use at compile static. It basically eliminates all the dynamic behavior, and it's just like Java. Static lookup of methods at compile time, very, very fast execution. Um, the at type checked I was trying to demonstrate gives you the same runtime behavior as the second one. Uh, so it still behaves like dynamic groovy, but it will, at compile time, enforce the errors in the way that I showed you that at compile static does. So you've actually got several options here. OK, so um, that I think that will have to end. So hopefully some of you, uh, did anyone see Josh, Josh's talk this morning on Spring Boot? Any hands? No one saw it. OK, so did he show it with Groovy? Oh, I'm disappointed. Josh is off my present list. I'm not prying any presents for him anymore. Um, <laughs> Well, that means that I have to run over slightly. <laughs> so uh, Groovy is quite nice for doing simple web services. So um, if we have a look in this directory, uh, I have a boot app. So this entire file, rest, at rest controller, main controller, that is an entire boot app, uh, Spring Boot application. And you can actually run it with Spring. So Spring is uh, the command line tool for Spring Boot. So we do Spring, run, boot app. And then within five, six seconds, it will start up, and you've got your simple web service. Because you don't always need to use a full Spring MVC or Grails or some other framework. You may sometimes just want a very light web front end to a database or uh, external web services or something that just serves uh, a few endpoints, very simply. OK, so then we can go to localhost, and there's our hello world. OK, so let's finally finish up. Um, so in summary, uh, Groovy is great for cross-platform scripting. Uh, it's great for doing uh, tests, especially Spock. I mean, if you don't use Spock, 
please, please do give it a try. Uh, I can't recommend it highly enough. I did, there was a whole, whole talk on it, and that talk didn't really scratch the surface of it, almost. So it's very powerful, but very uh, easy to use. Groovy is also seamlessly integrated with Java. So you can still continue to use Java, but use Groovy where it's appropriate. And this is the key point. There's an expression that when you, all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. But every problem is not a nail. A hammer is not always the right tool for the job. And that is the case for Java. It's very general purpose. But as you've seen, it's not great for doing scripting. And it's debatable whether it's particularly good for writing tests. It can be, um, but I much prefer Groovy. So this is all about adding an extra tool to your tool chest so that you can select the appropriate tool for a given job. OK, and don't forget that Groovy has a, um, uh, an active ecosystem. Uh, Gradle, if you, if you use Gradle, then you'll be doing Groovy because the build files are Groovy. Uh, and you can write your build, custom build tasks in Groovy in the build file. So that's important. Grails for web, full stack web applications. Uh, Jeb, that was talked about yesterday for functional testing using browsers. Uh, GVM, I mentioned earlier. Uh, Rat Pack is uh, kind of like uh, Ruby Sinatra. It's a very lightweight web framework. Uh, GPaaS for doing parallel, uh, parallelization and doing all that synchronization thing. Uh, that's way out of my field of expertise. And of course, Spring 4 finally has the Grails bean builder for defining beans. You know, I've been waiting for that forever. Uh, so the Spring family has really uh, embraced Groovy, except for Josh. Josh has not apparently embraced Groovy. But if you look at the announcements for Spring Boot, they actually give these groovy examples, because it's just a nice way of showing this condensed amount of code can start a full-blown application, a web application. OK, so thank you very much for staying and listening to me. And keep it groovy, baby.